you who don't know me, my name's Gail Snyder, and that was my husband, Sid, who told me earlier that he, um, he's very worried because he feels like he had the most difficult job here managing the Zoom. Now he's making a face, he's annoyed with me. Anyway, um, so thank you, Sid. Uh, this is a new experience for all of us, I think, or most of us um, doing Zoom meetings. Um, so I'm the founder and executive director of Coalition for the Deschutes. Through our shared vision for the Deschutes, we work with farmers, businesses, recreationists, and other conservation groups to restore the Deschutes River to a healthy condition so that fish, farms, and families can all thrive. So our program tonight has several parts to it. Jerry will talk about biodiversity and bees. Then we would like to tell you very quickly about a new shared vision program that we've just launched. And Sam will tell us about that. From there, Sam will hand the microphone to Anne Donnie with the Oregon Bee Project. After um, those speakers, then we'll take questions and then we'll wrap up. We're, we're anticipating that um, we might go a bit long, so you know that you can leave the meeting at any time, but um, our speakers will stay on a bit longer if, if um, people still have questions. So before we go any further, I would like to uh, just introduce you very quickly to Jenna Keaton. Jenna is the coordinator for the Middle Deschutes Watershed Council, and they are our co-hosts this evening for this talk. And Sid has to find Jenna. So. Right over here. Hi, everyone. I'm Jenna Keaton. So as Gail said, I work with the Middle Deschutes Watershed Council, and we work to restore and conserve habitats in the Middle Deschutes Watershed. So we do a lot of stream restoration, riparian restoration, and watershed education, uh, mainly in Jefferson County. So it's good to meet you all. Okay. Uh, okay. Janet didn't have her video on, so I couldn't have her show up on the screen. We're going to show her later, I hope, because um, I'm sure you want to see her as well as hear her. Uh, so Sid already went over the Zoom, uh, Zoom details. So now I get to say, here's Jerry. Well, am I on now? Yes. Cool. There, there we go. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm very glad that so many of you have uh, tuned in this afternoon or evening. Um, I see we have 65 people lined up right now. Um, Sid and Gail, can you just give me a thumbs up that everything, my voice is coming over the receiver, everything's smooth? Okay. Well, I'm very delighted to talk to you this afternoon about bees. But in truth, this program is not really about bees. It's really about biodiversity. And that is a thing very dear to my heart. I'm going to explain what it is. But the thing about it is I'm using bees here as an example. And I could just as easily have chosen other life forms. But many people are interested in bees. And I know the Coalition for the Deschutes is very interested in bees, and we will have several other bee-related people who will be speaking after me. But just so that you know, the main focus of my talk is biodiversity rather than bees per se. Now, um, I'm going to be showing you a PowerPoint presentation, which will take up probably about half an hour, something like that. And during that time, you won't see me, you'll see uh, my PowerPoint program. And then at the end of that, I'm gonna hand back to other folks. So let me see right now if I can share my screen so you can all see my talk about biodiversity and bees. It's gonna take just a moment. Does everyone see bees and biodiversity? Yes. Okay, good. Well, this talk originated when I was working at Olympic National Park as the chief of research there, which is a job I held for 13 years. And during that time, I became very involved with uh, a bee program that I'll be talking about during this, the course of my talk today. So I just wanted to give a prop appropriate credit to the Park Service, 
who was my employer during the time that a lot of this was going on. But I have been involved with bees before I worked for the Park Service and uh, I continue to be interested in them since then. So I have not been introduced, I guess, this evening, but for those of you who do not know me, um, I have a PhD in entomology, which is to say insects. My actual PhD work was on aquatic insects, but I've had a lot of exposure to both ants and bees in the order Hymenoptera. And so this program chooses bees as an example. Now, I have been, wait a minute, I have to be able to change the slides here. Hold on. I hope that that's gonna work. I have been involved with biodiversity since this little boy was me. And that was a long time ago. But ever since I was a little, little, little guy, I've been very interested and concerned about living things. And biodiversity is the sum of all the living things that surround us. When I was about seven or eight years old, like this, apparently the same age as you see in this picture, my parents took me to the Academy of Natural Sciences, which is the big natural history museum in Philadelphia which is where I was growing up. This is the way the building looked in 2012. It is a wonderful, wonderful place. And when I was there as a student, when I was seven and eight, nine years old, uh, it was like the most wonderful place that I had ever heard of. And then when I was 11 and 12 years old, I actually had a volunteer full-time job well, not full-time, part-time, a volunteer part-time job at the museum in the Department of Malacology, which is seashells. And the Academy has the world's second largest collection of seashells. So when most people go to a museum, this is what you see. You know, people go to a natural history museum and you see the exhibits for the public. But that's not really what a museum truly is. A museum actually is more like this. And this picture was actually taken at the Smithsonian, but the Academy's collections look much the same way. This is a part of the bird division at the Smithsonian. There are so many different kinds of living things. It's like a paradise for the person who's interested. But trying to convey the diversity and the wonder of all this is a thing which has my life since then. You know, I find it very hard to talk to people about this subject because you start listing different things and after about two or three minutes, people's eyes glaze over. And I thought that this cartoon was very relevant. In fact, this cartoon is kind of like the story of my life. So there's all these wondrous plants and animals out there, but it's like an overwhelming number. How, how do you make that appeal to people and how do you convey this diversity to people and why should people care about that? Well, the caring part I think is easy. The caring part is that the plants and animals of the earth are the living fabric that supports our lives every day. Everything, every molecule of food we eat and every drop of water we drink, everything that we use to survive comes from our ecosystem and the ecosystem services. But conveying this has been very, very difficult. Maybe some of you have seen this diagram, which is called a species scape. This is from a publication uh, quite a few years ago now. And this odd picture shows the diversity of living things sorted out by the size of that thing in this picture. So you can see who the 800 pound gorilla is in this picture. And obviously that is the big fly up there. And insects represent the largest diversity among things that are big enough for us to see. Now, I don't know if there are more bacteria or more viruses than there are of these multicellular things, but among the the things that are big enough for us to see, insects are by far the biggest uh, diversity. And you can see the trees over there on the left-hand side, they're, they're fairly numerous. 
look at how big those mushrooms are. So that's the fungi. And then each of the other groups, that big pillow lumpy looking thing in the lower left the corner is a uh, mite. So the mites are fairly numerous. And then you've spent probably your whole life concerned about that little guy. So this uh, little elk or whatever it is, represents all of the diversity of all the mammals on the earth. And you can see it's relatively small amount. So how do you convey all the rest of it? Well, first of all, how many living things are, how many different species, not individuals, but how many species, how many kinds of things are there? If you read most books, you'll find a number given, which is about 3 million. But Terry Irwin, who's the guy in the sweater over here on the left, he's shown here at one of his study sites in the Brazilian rainforest. He has gone uh, into publications proposing that there are as many as 30 million species of things. And a lot of people have argued with that, saying his estimate is way too high. But just the fact that there is an uncertainty of this order of magnitude tells you how vast the biodiversity is and how little we actually know about it. Now, the, uh, Terry Irwin's work has been published in National Geographic as well as a bazillion of his scientific articles. So I'm not gonna get into what he's doing here, but just suppose to say that there is a vast uncertainty of how many living things there are. Now, for those of you who saw my Secret Life of Rivers talk a few weeks ago, I'm going to repeat a little bit of what I said then, and this is going to reinforce what you heard back then. For those of you who were not on that previous call, in order to talk about diversity, you have to go through this. You have to go through this. We have to use some sort of mnemonic, and probably all of you had a mnemonic like this one, something like it. Uh, this is the one I used when I was in high school, and those of you who have been in biology class, you know what these, what these, what the silly sentence stands for. This is your way of remembering the classification hierarchy of all living things. So we're going to have to talk about this a little bit in order to get our hands around biodiversity. So, for example, let's take an example of an insect here. This is a dragonfly. Well, you all. Obviously, it's an animal, so the kingdom is animal. The phylum is arthropo arthropoda, arthropoda. Those are the things with jointed legs. The insects, together, all of the insects are a class. And then there are various orders within the insects. And a dragonfly is an odonate. It's one of the odonata. That's its order. And then there are families within the orders. And then there are genera singular genus, plural genera, and then there are many species. So each genus can have many species, and each family can have many genera. You get the idea of this. So let's choose a, a mammal example uh, to take this just one step farther. Let's take an animal that's a vertebrate, has a backbone. It's a mammal. And let's look at some carnivores. Now, underneath the order, there are families. And in the animal world, family names all end in I-D-A-E. They're, they're Latin names, all end in I-D-A-E. So I'm going to show you some families of carnivores. Now, these are not just five different kinds of mammals. These are five families within the order carnivores. And you don't need to know that that thing in the upper left is a coyote. What is clear to you is that it's a dog, okay? It's the family canidae. And the one in the upper right, you don't need to know what kind of bear it is, but it's a bear, obviously, it's a bear. Family ursidae. The one in the lower left, a kitty cat. Family is felidae. The one in the middle, the raccoon, anybody know the name, of the Latin name of the family of raccoons? That's the Procyonidae. And then the lower right, you have a weasel, that's Mustelidae. Now, we don't need to know what different species these are, but just to say that you would never mistake 
a dog for a cat. I mean, not likely. I mean, you may not know what kind of bear it is, but a bear is not a dog and a bear is not a weasel. I mean, these are families of carnivores. Now, here's the next thing, and I, I use the same slide in my Secret of the Rivers talk, so pardon me for repeating. But let's talk for a moment about house flies. If I asked you what one of these is, and you saw it buzzing around in the window screen of your house, you would say, oh, it's a house fly. But these are not five species of flies. They're not even five genera of flies. These are five families of flies. The Sarcophagidae, the Anthomyidae, the Muscidae, the Californidae, and the Tachinidae, five families of flies, each one of them with many, many genera, and each genus with many, many species. Take the family Tachinidae here, 1,300 North American species. The diversity is enormous. And then, you knew I'd get around to this sooner or later. I did promise I was going to talk about bees, right? <laughs> okay, well, these are not just four different kinds of bees. These are four families of bees. The Helictidae, the Calidae, the Andrenidae and the Megachylidae. These are four of the, what I guess in North America, there's what, about eight families of bees? So just for an example, here's a helictid, one of the sweat bees, 500 US species of helictids, 500 species, just of this one family of bees. So how in the world do you ever get your brain around any of this? You know, with I always tell people a good place to start if you want to learn about nature is with birds. Because birds, there's a tractable number of them that you can discover. Like any state in the United States typically has about, I don't know, 400 species of birds. And on a, on a good day, you might find 30 or 40 of them. I mean, you know, it's a number you can deal with. But the only way to deal with insects like bees or diversity in general is spending a lot of time with the microscope. So I'm going to talk about what it takes to learn bees or any of these groups. A lot of times people call me up and they've got some bug and they wish to be and they want me to tell them what species it is. Well, it is impossible for, <laughs> for any human being to be shown any kind of insect and to know what species it is. There is no one, no one that can do that. So let, let's kind of get through the classification order of, of entomology students right here. The undergraduate student can, you know, ID an order of insects. Like you can tell it's, it's a beetle rather than a dragonfly, or if it's a bee rather than a fly. And you can key some easy families, but that's about it. Now, graduate students, in the university can do these things you see here. And despite the fact that I've had like 15 years of entomology training, 15 years of college, I put myself in this group right here. If you give me a bug, I can sit down with a microscope and work it out to family. I'm gonna know a few genera, very, very few species, except in areas where I have specifically done work. There's only one or two people in the world that are in this next highest category. Here is my dear friend, Dave Cavanaugh, who is retired now, but who was the uh, chief curator of the uh, section of entomology at the Cal Academy in San Francisco. I met him some years ago. I was working at Olympic National Park, and he came up and he wanted to collect those beetles you see in the upper right-hand corner. These are a family of beetles. So what is the order of beetles? The beetles are Coleoptera, that's the order. And then within that order, there are families. So the family is Corabidae, the ground beetles. And this one is Nebria. It's a genus of beetles that come out at night on high mountaintops and run around, around the edges 
of snow fields and glaciers. So he needed me to help him to get up there to the high country and we figured out how he could go and collect his nebria. But only somebody like Dave Cavanaugh would be able to do the things you see in this picture. They're just, it's just huge, vast diversity. I don't know if any of you know the Chuck Norris jokes. Uh, when I had little kids, uh, they used my kids used to tell me the Chuck Norris jokes. Uh, he's like kind of the ultra, ultra, ultra superhero on some of the TV shows. You know how little kids wear uh, Superman PJs? Well, they would say that Superman wears Chuck Norris PJs. And then uh, what are some other uh, Chuck Norris? There are a lot of these. Chuck Norris has counted to infinity twice. Um, Chuck Norris can watch the TV show. He can watch 60 minutes in 20 minutes. Uh, there's no command key on Chuck Norris's computer because he's always in command. And my favorite one of these is Chuck Norris went into Burger King and he ordered an egg McMuffin and he got it. So Chuck Norris is a pretty huge superhero. But he can't do these things. I mean, even Chuck Norris can't do the Curculeonids. Those are the weevils, or the Staphylinids, or the Acalyptrate muscoid flies. Forget about it. These things are beyond human endeavor. They just beyond and beyond. So what does it take to be an entomologist? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to learn how to use dichotomous keys. This is the way scientists identify flies or bees or whatever they are. And if you go out in the desert and with your net and you collect a bunch of bees and you have a little bee in your net and you have to put it on a pin or put it on a microscope slide and you need to look at a key like this, you'll notice they are numbered what are called couplets down the left side of this text. There's 18 and then 18 prime and then 19 and 19 prime and 20 and 20 prime. And each of those couplets describes two alternate possibilities. And you read the description there, like look at 19. It says with two submarginal cells or three submarginal cells. And depending on whether it has two or three, you would either go to 20 or you would go to 21. You're gonna follow a path. Now, of course, you have to know what submarginal cells are. Well, that's a small problem. So your first little problem is to learn all the wing veins of the insects. And believe it or not, all of these names, this is the thing that every entomology student has to learn, memorize, basically. The cubital veins, the, 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 the media veins, the radial veins, the costal veins, and so on. Um, here, I'm going to go back one slide. Whoops. See where the black arrow is in that one diagram? That is this one basal vein, which would have either a strong curve or a weak curve. And some of these genera differences, genus differences, would be made, or in fact, family differences, would be made by whether that particular vein was straight or curved. So these are wing venation. Another thing you have to learn about are the legas. Insects have six legas. Why do I call them legas? Well, that's because my wife calls them legas. And once you start calling them legas, you're never going to be able to call them legs anymore. But there are many different features on the legs of insects. They have little hairs and spurs that have unknown functions. Some of them have obvious functions, but I mean, you have to learn what all the parts are and whether it has one tibial spur or two tibial spurs. The mouth parts of insects are very complicated, and bees especially have very complicated mouth parts. What a lot of people don't realize is that bees normally fold up their mouth parts and retract them within their uh, head while they're flying, and then when they land on a flower, they extend those parts. And that is the exploded view of a honeybee's mouth parts you're seeing on the right there. Um, each of those parts obviously has a name. Is there two maxillary palps or three maxillary palps? Is the galia and the licinia and all of these little technical anatomical details all have to be looked at very carefully under the microscope. There are long tongue bees, 
and short tongue bees. And you can obviously see the difference here in the picture. And of course, the long tongue bees can reach into deeper flowers. The shorter tongue bees have to be in the flower where the pollen or the nectar source would be closer to where a short little tongue could go. These mouthparts are so complicated that they are not just complicated to us humans. They are also complicated to the insects themselves. So, I can't give you a minute to absorb that. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, moving right on. So, where do bees come from anyway? Well, bees are offshoots of the wasps. And we're going to talk about that more in a couple of minutes here. But just to say that bees arose around the same time that flowering plants arose. So far as we know, the earliest pollinators of flowering plants were probably beetles, beetles and perhaps flies. But the bees came along shortly thereafter. So we're talking about the very end of the dinosaur era, say the upper Cretaceous. So like what, 100 million years ago or something like that? And then as the flowering plants started to radiate, as the flowering plants started to radiate, the bees also started to radiate and become more uh, species, more species of bees. So they're relatively new on the face of the earth. Things like roaches and dragonflies and stoneflies and um, Ro roaches, mantises, grasshoppers, things like that are much older than bees. Bees are relatively new invention. Here at the bottom of this family tree, you see that the ants and the bees are fairly closely related and that all of these guys are related to different families of wasps. So what is it that actually makes a bee a bee? Well, in this diagram, you see a family tree where at the top in the middle, you see Svecoidea. Svecoidea, those are the Svesid wasps, and I'm gonna talk about them in a minute. And then to the right at the top, you see Apoidea coming off. That is the branching, the bees are the Apoidea, and they come off from another group called the Svesid wasps. So I have some Svesid wasps for you. And as in those previous two pictures that you saw, we had the families, you had the families of flies and the families of bees. Well, once again, we've got the same kind of thing here. These are all members of the Svecodia, the, the group of Svesid wasps, and these are all considered individual families of specid wasps. These are the nearest neighbors, the nearest ancestors, or a common, um, uh, what do you call it? The common, uh, I'm having a senior moment here. What do you, what, what do you call it? The common ancestor with, with the bees. So what makes a bee a bee? Well, all of these specids are carnivores. They prey on other animals, many of them, uh, other insects. The one in the upper left there, that philanthine, is attacking a bee. You can see he's killed or he's paralyzed this bee and he's going to take it back to his nest uh, or her nest and feed her babies with it. But bees are vegetarian. They have specialized parts to carry pollen, usually a little basket of special hairs, either on the legas or on his abdomen, they have special pollen baskets. And another thing that they have is they have plumed hairs. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you look at a microphotograph of a bee's body, you look at the hairs on a bee's body, you'll see that the hairs have hairs. These are plumose hairs. This is a bee characteristic, and you can only see it under really, really high power. And then another important thing about bees is that many of them, have very advanced social behavior. And in fact, that's a subject so huge that we could have three or four more full hours just devoted to the evolution of social behavior in bees. Very few wasps are social. There are a few 
social wasps, but none of them have this very advanced societies like the bees have. The bees are very, very famous for this. And you probably know this one most famous, most well-known social bee. And I always tell people in my bee talk, there's only one single picture of honeybees. And this is it right here. All I'm going to say about honeybees is the following. First of all, they are not native to the United States. They originated in Europe. They were brought to America by the early pioneers. They have invaded North America and taken it over. I do not know exactly what effect that has had on the native bees, but I am sure that it has had a very profound effect. And we can argue about that in the question and answer, if you like. Having said all this, bees are unique in North America in having huge colonies with you know, 60,000 bees in a hive. They are unique in having stores of food, which they store up in honeycomb in large mass amounts, which we can profit uh, by taking some of their honey and making honey for ourselves. And they are also unique in being, uh, keeping their hives warm and at a living temperature through the whole cold winter. So uh, honeybees are very different from all of our North American native bees. Um, I'm not gonna come back to the honeybees, but just to, it's obviously clear that because of these characteristics you see in this one slide, that makes them tremendously important for our agriculture in America. So however, whatever their effect may have been on our native bees, it's really clear that honeybees are important to us now because of our massive industrial agriculture. So what about the native bees? They're actually something close to 4,000 species of native bees in North America. And I've divided them up into different life styles. None of them make giant hives. None of them store large amounts of honey that you can profit from. Most of them are either solitary or live in small colonies. Some of them dig their holes into the ground. Um, this scene on the left here is a site that I used to visit at Olympic National Park. And that picture on the right shows the little holes that were occupied by these uh, andrenid bees. Here are some typical bee in the ground. These were made by a sweat bee, one of the helictids, uh, Helictus rubicundus, which I studied for uh, six years at a one single colony. This is the one that I studied. They live in small colonies of maybe at the most 100 bees. Uh, only the queens will overwinter in the ground and they make nests that look like this. There'll be a hole that goes straight down as much as 18 inches. At the end of each hole, there will be a series of cells. The mother bee starts out in the spring by going out and collecting pollen. And she brings a ball of pollen and puts it down in the bottom of this little uh, tube that she excavates. And then she lays an egg on that little ball of pollen. And you can see the little balls of pollen and the little eggs down on each one. And then these little bees hatch out of there. They turn first into a, pupa, a larva and then a pupa and then they finally emerge and they fly around and they collect more pollen. And the colony gradually grows for a couple months until then some of the queens, they make new queens, they disperse, and then this, the cycle is repeated. Bumblebees are another example of small colonies. Uh, we have in North America, I think something like 20, you know, some of you guys who are in the bee group uh, listening to this talk, you're gonna correct me on the actual number of uh, bombus in the United States. I, I think it's under 30, is it 35? Something like that. It's a tractable number of species of bumblebees. They make nests, usually in the ground, where they build these little pots made of wax and they fill them with honey. The little baby bees feed on that. Here's the life cycle of bumblebees. And I will say that we're going to talk more about bumblebees after my talk because there is a Oregon State 
statewide initiative about to begin where we'll be trying to find all the species of bumblebees we can within the state of Oregon. Some bees burrow into wood in different ways to make their nests. And they will once again put a little ball of pollen in there and then lay an egg on the ball of pollen. And then in some cases, they will fill up one single tube with as many as seven or eight ball, with a ball of pollen uh, with an egg on it, then a little barrier, usually made of mud or leaves, and then another ball of pollen, and then another egg, and another barrier, then another ball of pollen, and so on. So these are all car carpenters of different kinds. The leaf cutter bees that you may have in your garden are examples of these ones that mine. These are the megachylid bees. If you look at that picture at the lower right, you see the bee does not have pollen baskets on its legs, but it carries pollen on a special basket on the underside of its abdomen. And the bee in the lower right is carrying a disc of a leaf that she has cut. The bee number two, the picture number two, is cutting that leaf. And you may have seen in your garden trees or shrubs that have a neatly cut semicircular uh, hole out of it. Those are leaf cutter bees. They're going to use that cut section of leaf to fill up the space between the little ball of pollen and the eggs in their nesting tubes. So, it, you know, there's many different kinds here. Oh, here's a leaf cutter in the act of, yeah, mason bees are leaf cutters. These are the family Megachylidae, leaf cutter bees. Then there are cuckoo bees. What are cuckoos? Well, cuckoos are parasites. I don't know if you know this, but you know, the European cuckoo, uh, which is the one where it's been most well studied, is what's called a nest parasite. Uh, cuckoo birds lay their eggs in the nest of other birds, and their babies are raised by the host parent. And it's just the same way with cuckoo bees. Uh, there are quite a number of bees that have evolved to become parasites on their close relatives. And each of the ones you see in this picture, all five of these are different kinds of cuckoo bees. They do not have pollen baskets. They do not carry pollen. All they do is invade the nests of closely related species of bees, put their babies in there, and the host bee has to feed those babies and raise them. It's, it's, it's astonishing. Nature is astonishing. So one way that I came to the thing was because I became involved in a National Park Service-wide effort to find and identify as many alpine bees as we could in all of the national parks nationwide. So I'm the guy in the blue shirt in that third picture there. Um, J.D. Herndon is the shaggy looking young fellow on the left who's uh, getting his PhD right now on bumblebees. And then the, on the right there in the white is uh, Dr. Jessica Ricken, who has a PhD in entomology from Oregon State and who was the leader of this project in all of the national parks. The way we did this was we go out and you put little bowls of water out in these alpine meadows. And the bowls are blue, green, and white. These pictures, uh, the colors carefully chosen. In each little bowl, you put water and a single drop of dish soap. The bees land on the water to get a drink. And because of the dish soap, the surface tension is reduced. So what happens is they fall in the water and they get drowned. And then what we do is we come by, you put out the bowls early in the morning, you come by late in the afternoon, you gather up all the bees and you put them into Ziploc bags and you send them to Sam Drogi's sweatshop where a team of must be thousands of students find all these bees, wash them in water, blow them dry using a hair dryer, and then pin them up. And I have no idea. Sam Drogi is a scientist with the US Geological Survey Biological Resource Division in Patuxent, Maryland. Uh, how in the world he ever did this, I, I don't know, because he handled millions of bees from hundreds of parks. Here's Sam. He's like some kind of uh, 
Superman, I guess. He's like Chuck Norris of the bee world. I, I, I have this mental picture that his lab looks something like this. <laughs> These are people all identifying bees. I don't know how he did it. But at any rate, the goal was to find as many species of bees in US national parks as possible. And we found, oh geez, I think it was close to 80 species in Olympic National Park. And um, we also worked in uh, Mount Rainier and North Cascades National Park, and also at uh, Lewis and Clark National Historical Park in Astoria, Oregon. So all of these bees eventually end up on a pin with a label, just like you see here. And I am just about done saying what I came to tell you about. Normally, at this spot in my program, I would end up with some 3D images of bees that are taken through microscope. And if you were sitting in a room with me right now, everybody coming into the room, I would have handed you a pair of those funny blue and green, uh, blue and red um, 3D glasses. And I would tell everybody to put on your glasses. And then I would show you these 3D pictures. Now this thing just looks blurry to you right now on your computer screen. But if you had those 3D glasses on, this is truly amazing. This is absolutely incredible. So you zoom in on it like that. But you don't have 3D glasses and that's the COVID virus problem we face right now. So I'm gonna end at this point and say thank you. And I'm gonna hand this program over to the other folks who are gonna talk more about the bees that we can work on here in Oregon. So thank you, everybody. So I think you're back to me now, Sid, am I on? Ah, here I am. So um, Jerry kindly pointed out that I failed to adequately introduce him. So fortunately for me, he did describe some of his own characteristics in the course of his talk. And so I've just jotted them down. First, um, like the beetle, I think with Dr. Kavanaugh, Jerry likes to come out at night on high mountain tops and run around snowfields and glaciers. And like the bees, he has advanced social behavior. And as we've just witnessed, he has mouth parts. Um, so I, <laughs> I'm now going to hand over to Sam, Sam Bango. Sam is um, doing an internship with both North Unit Irrigation District and Coalition for the Deschutes. Take it away, Sam. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, can everybody hear me okay? All right. So I am so excited to announce our new project, which is Plotting for Pollinators. Um, in response to this terrifying decline in native and domestic bees, um, this program by the coalition in partnership with North Unit um, and the Middle Deschutes Watershed Council um, plants flowering food for pollinators among Central Oregon farms. And we are so lucky to have a wonderful team um, who's actually here with us tonight. So we'll see if we can shift the video over to everybody. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Inga Eriks, who's a volunteer with the coalition and the lead with our project. And then Lisa Windham, who is the special projects coordinator at North Unit Irrigation District. Jenna Keaton is the coordinator at Middle Deschutes Watershed Council. Nancy Richards is a farmer and a coalition Deschute of the Deschutes um, board member. And Heike Williams is an incredible bee expert and research technician with Central Oregon Agricultural Research and Extension Center. And then, of course, Gail, who is our wonderful executive director at the coalition. Um, so I'd like to show you guys our new website where you can find some more information um, about this project. Okay, can everybody see my screen okay? All right, so if you go to coalitionforthedeschutes.org and under shared vision, we've got plotting for pollinators. We'll see if my screen wants to load. Okay, and there it is. So you can learn a little bit more about what we're doing. Um, with this project and 
I think that's all that I will say about it. Um, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Kristen Alligood with um, Farmers Conservation Alliance. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, really excited to be here and to um, have listened to that talk. Thanks so much. That was so fun. Um, I work with Far the Farmers Conservation Alliance based in Hood River, Oregon. And um, I just want to say briefly that we are really interested in um, all of the pollinator work going on in Oregon. And we have started to partner with um, uh, irrigation districts in the Hood River area, um, as well as um, soil and water conservation districts in the Hood River area um, to work to expand uh, pollinator corridors along irrigation um, pipelines. And so um, we're currently in the process of working through that and we are excited about potentially trying to expand those programs into Central Oregon. So stay tuned for hopefully some fun stuff coming up in the future. And with that, I will turn it over to Anthony, who we've actually been um, talking with with those projects as well. Can everybody hear me? All right. Um, and do yeah, I can share you, screen? Can you passing? enable your video? Uh, oh, everything? there we go. <laughs> so, um, do we, I have the ability to share a screen, is that correct? Yes. Okay. All right. Let's do this. Uh, there we go. All right. And let me just, the slideshow. I just want to thank everybody for um, the, what a great program. And Jerry, that was really remarkable. The one thing that I'm always amazed of is the talent. Um, that we have in the Pacific Northwest. There are so many people, well, um, maybe not of the Chuck Norris level uh, that Jerry is, but we certainly have some remarkable, uh, we, we have all we need in the Pacific Northwest to be able to do um, some amazing things. And I, I'm you know, really delighted um, to be um, uh, starting to uh, talk with the coalition. I think the coalition is really, uh, Forward thinking and the new project is really uh, remarkable. Now, if I can just figure out how to start this and try this. Okay. Use, use the share screen, right? And, and it should bring up a panel of what window you want to share. Yeah, the only problem is I do need to, I've got to launch my. Um, But I can't do that at the same time. So what I'll do is I'll do it like this. Should work fine. Uh, let's see. This will do. Okay, let's just minimize, move all these around here. Can everybody see the screen okay? It, it looks like looks good. Go ahead. All right. The only thing is, okay. So I was gonna uh, let's just see if I can drag. What if I did this? Does it now show the full screen? Yes. Oh, but well, heck, that's good. That's great. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. So the first thing I want to say, I'm going to be talking just briefly about the initiatives here in Oregon which unfortunately started about seven years ago with that tragic uh, bumblebee poisoning that took place, Target parking lot in uh, on National Pollinator Week, a real black eye for the state. And to the state's credit, um, they quickly pulled some legislation together that created uh, a new law in Oregon, and well, it's now an old law in Oregon, uh, to create a uh, education, an outreach and education plan for the state. Um, and this is what the Oregon Bee Project is. And here you can see us sitting outside the legislature with Representative Jeff Reardon holding our strategic plan. Uh, Oregon Bee Project is a collaboration between state agencies, Oregon Department of Agriculture, Department of Forestry, and OSU Extension. We're just finishing our first strategic plan, which spanned two years with four goals. The first one is to protect bees from pesticide exposure. 
Second goal is to increase pollinator habitat. The third is reduce impacts of diseases and pests on bees. And the fourth, which really comes to Jerry's point, is to expand our knowledge of Oregon bees. And we are just in the process of working on our next strategic plan, and we really would love to have some Central Oregon representation. I think the coalition would be a great partner uh, on being on our advisory committee. The, one of the reasons I think this is because many of the activities that we do, I think, pair very well with the coalition's mandate. So the first thing that we do is we train and engage. We help people um, make decisions by giving them decision support. We flag out the innovators in the state, the people who are going that extra mile to help pollinators. And then, of course, we've got this native bee survey. And I'm really delighted that two of the people who do the native bee survey here in Oregon, Heiko Williams is one of them, but also Tony Steppen, uh, both in Central Oregon, are part of this initiative. I'm going to go through this really quickly. just wanted to give you a broad overview. With training and engaging, a big part of what we do is we train pesticide applicators. Uh, we have very targeted training that, has, that deals with both how to use uh, insecticides, but also vegetation management. We've trained over 5,000 applicators in the state. It's very rigorous. They have a, a clicker. Uh, they answer questions, and we quickly found out. When we use these clickers and we ask them questions about the existing bee warnings on labels, many of them knew where it was on the label, but they couldn't interpret it. You can see in that first graph, maybe 25% could understand what the bee warnings meant. What was really heartening, though, uh, when we, uh, you can see, so in the second two graphs, different parts of the label, they were, un they were unable to understand. But what was heartening was, after the trainings, people come out with very high levels of comprehension, so the training is quite effective. Second part is decision-making support. We provide tools like this one, which we give out to all the applicators in the trainings, how to read that pesticide label. We break it down. We make it easy. This can go in the truck cab, and they can uh, quickly uh, refer to it when they're at a point when they're making decisions. We've also worked closely with a number of commodity groups. Here we are with the Clover Commission, Oregon. We have sat down and kind of with the beekeepers and the growers and the crop consultants and worked out some kind of an arrangement over what safe practices would look like. These get translated into these easy to understand postcards uh, that we give to the growers and um, uh, test them uh, over time to see if they're picking up and adopting these practices. What works really well for these growers is in addition is we have a good network of volunteers and oftentimes uh, here you can see the two, one of two of the commodity groups who work with the Clover Commission, but also the specialty seed growers of Western Oregon. We ha have them donate seeds, and then we give them out to the public. Uh, these are seeds grown in Oregon. Oregon is a tremendous seed growing re uh, region. As you probably know, Central Oregon is a big seed growing part of the state. Third part I wanted just to flag is we we identify innovators, and this is where I really am interested in working with the coalition going forward. We did have an initiative early on where we would identify growers that were really going that extra mile for pollinator protection. We had a sign that could go on the front. Uh, we, they were all committed to doing bee survey on their farms. Uh, here you can see Dave Hoyter. He's a cranberry grower down in Bandon. And these are the bees that were collected in his bogs. But sadly, we didn't have any participants in this initial pilot program from Central Oregon, even though, um, you know, here you can see carrot seed, uh, parsley seed, but also the alfalfa seed that's grown in the region uh, are dependent on pollinators. We are going to be rolling out a new program in the fall called the Pollinator Stewards Program, uh, which will provide a kind of a day long training uh, in pollinator protection specifically to growers qualifies them for pesticide recertification credits, so there's an incentive for them to show up. Uh, and we're hoping uh, that way to be able to reach uh, growers that we previously have not been able to reach. But I did want to conclude by just coming back to what Jerry was talking about with Native Bee Survey, and he really set it up wonderfully. It's a complicated, complex problem and uh, a difficult one. And here in our region, the last time anybody tried to give a stab at what was out there was 1969. And at the time, 
uh, it was estimated that were, there was about 900 species in the Pacific Northwest. But it really is, and you know, initiatives that Jerry was involved with getting off the ground were really groundbreaking. It really has to be put into perspective because by and large, we have not really surveyed the bees. This is a recent study that went through, went all the way back to the 19th century and looked at where significant bee surveys were done. And what they mean by significant bee surveys is they detected at least 100 species. Uh, the, you can see the, each dot is a study. You can see very few dots to begin with anywhere in the United States. Um, the smaller the dot represents the, um, uh, the area that was surveyed and also the number of species is the darkness of the dot. And you can see as you go to the eastern United States, the dots are pale. You can barely see them because the bee fauna on the eastern part of the U.S. is much less diverse than it is on the west side. But you can see this big gaping hole in Oregon. Now, we had a large base of volunteers and we were inspired by Oregon flora. Oregon flora was a real um, remarkable project. And you, if you haven't seen Oregon flora, here's the first volume, second volume is coming up. You open the book up and you look inside and for each species, a very scientifically uh, careful, just um, pulling out the, the actual species, because sometimes the same specimen, uh, the, same, um, the same species may be named multiple things, and um, the floor has done a really good job of kind of consolidating them in to one entry. Range maps, descriptions, really a kind of accounting of the flora of Oregon. And when we looked at it, if you pick up the first volume, one of the first quotes in the first volume is, goes like this. It says, Thomas Jefferson told Lewis and Clark to go out there and identify everything. Well, it's been 200 years and it's high time we had an inventory. And so the floor sort of started this way when they started back in the 90s. In a way, it's fitting that this should be such a grassroots sort of thing. Instead of a huge agency that could have put a million into a floor project, but hasn't and won't, it's heartening to see that many dedicated people will get the job done. This is the inspiration for us uh, with the Native Bees of Oregon. Uh, we formed the Oregon Bee Atlas. We are all Star Trek fans. And so we took the, the slogan to boldly go and find bees that no Oregonian has seen before. We've just constituted our first master program. We've been doing this for two years. We're now, we have a, a master certificate program through OSU. Um, and uh, in the audience, we have Tony Steffen and Heike Williams who lead up um, the regional team uh, in Central Oregon. We've got a great regional team in Central Oregon, but you can see we have regional teams across uh, Oregon. Obviously, west of the Cascades is a little more dense, but we are moving our way east. And it's a great program. You get online training to learn with videos and demonstrations on how to do this complicated stuff. Our goal is to turn any person into a Chuck Norris. Step two is field and lab training where we take people out, they go through with experts and they get to see how you actually do this work. Step three, volunteers go out and collect bees. Here's Francis Ambrose uh, up, in the, uh, up in Mosier. You can see the coverage is really wonderful. Each one of those dots represents a collection. And it's not just a bunch of collections in the Willamette Valley. Our volunteers are pushing out the Mal here and Harney, where a lot of our bee biodiversity is. Step four, our volunteers actually, we, they crack open the book that Jerry described and they start working through their bees. Each of the bee is museum quality. We grade them, they get feedback. Uh, they get to a point where they could be submitted in a museum, they're all barcoded, and then they have an opportunity to try and figure out what the bee is. The bees come into us at OSU, and then they run through our Chuck Norris, which is Lincoln Best, uh, arguably uh, the person who most knows most about the Pacific Northwest bee fauna. He goes through, does his identifications. These, some of these bees, as uh, Jerry points out, can't be identified. Uh, we then move them to the Logan Bee Lab um, in uh, uh, um, Logan, Utah, which is the National Bee Lab. Uh, and then some of these things will just take a long time to get figured out. After that, we get uh, undergraduates uh, to digitize the data. It goes and it gets uploaded so it's available to everybody. 
And it's remarkable what these volunteers have turned up. In the very first year, which we've, uh, we're just about to publish the data, um, some species that are uh, listed as conservation concern, we've been able to find nice pockets of them where we didn't know where they were. We have some bumblebees, for example, that it wasn't clear that we had state records for. And then we have a whole lot of other bees where we may not have seen them since the 1940s. Um, I also just want to point out with the Cons uh, Farmers Conservation Alliance, we have uh, assisted them as well on this pollinator pipeline project. And I, I really would encourage, I think this is a great opportunity. Here's the site up in Hood River. You can see the pipeline, you can see the terrible weed uh, um, weed cover on these uh, sites. They've really been neglected. Um, they will be going through as part of this uh, NRCS CIG grant and really taking that and turning it into a pollinator pathway. Uh, we have these nesting blocks uh, situated across the site uh, and you, you can see there are these various layers where we can split them open and we have bees nesting in them. As Jerry pointed out, there's uh, about 100 species that will nest in these blocks. Uh, and that'll give us a uh, be able to track how the uh, how the bee fauna changes over time. The other thing that we off we we do we have these bees and we can turn them into outreach. People are really fascinated by these bees. We have these little cards uh, with some of the bee species that our volunteers have found. Uh, they can be bent over on a popsicle stick with some uh, uh, rubber racers and elastic band and a string and turned into a buzzy toy. And that is what I, the last thing I just want to say is what's happened is we've really developed some smart people across the state and we've got lots of people who can do this kind of work who can really talk to the public about pollinators uh, and all of our volunteers have uh, have an obligation to do outreach and they're very good at it we have lots of cards that they can take out to the public to get across these, uh, get across some of these themes, these key messages. And I'm just really excited at the uh, prospect of um, expanding uh, our efforts into Central Oregon. Thank you very much. Great. Okay. Um, it is time for questions and answers. And so um, I would like to ask anyone who has a question. Uh, there are two different ways that you can ask your question. Um, if you open up your participant, if you click on the participants button down at the bottom of your screen um, um, and you look at the bottom of the panel that comes up, there will be either a button or an icon uh, that says raise hand. If you uh, click that, then um, you can be called on to ask a question of Jerry or uh, Andoni or uh, any of the other folks that were uh, speaking tonight. And uh, the other option is to type your question into the chat box, in which case I will just read it out and we'll see uh, who wants to answer it. If you have a, a, a and please do mention if you have a, a question for a specific person um, who you would like to have answered that. So um, raise your hand now if you have a question. There is one in the chat box right now. Um, the question is, if honeybees are not native to North America, then was there no honey here before Europeans brought honeybees here? Who would like to take that? That's, that's fine, I can do that. And it did respond to the person who posted that, but only in a one-to-one -one, uh, response. Um, the answer is no, there were no honeybees in North America before the European bee was brought over here. And what is more is nothing in our North American fauna is anything like the honeybee. As I think I said in my talk, all of our bees, that we are native bees, are small colonies that um, you know, never reach the size or proportions or anything about the life's uh, complica complications of European honeybees. Um, we just, our families of bees are just nothing like those in the, in the you know, like Apis, yeah, nothing like them. Okay, we have another question in the uh, chat box, which is, is bee diversity declining? Well, wow, that's a really good one. That's a great question. Um, there has been a fairly lively controversy on whether European honeybees have had impacts on native bee taxa. And 
you know, I, I have known a number of folks who have written papers on this subject. Um, and Donny, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the paper by Vivian Butts in the uh, annual review of entomology some years back, but at any rate, uh, her family is from a, a, a professional, uh, she grew up in the uh, honeybee, um, commercial uh, honeybee. Alberta. I know yeah, exactly. But exactly. Uh, yeah, of course. Exactly. Yeah. Well, Vivian and I were in graduate school together at uh, Georgia, and uh, we used to have uh, big discussions about this. And she would say, well, there's no proof that honeybees have had any effect on the native bees. And my comment would be, there was no baseline studies of what kind of bees there were here in North America before honeybees were brought here. I mean, we still don't know what the native bee populations and distributions are like, which is why we're doing this native bee atlas right now. We're trying to get a handle on it. But you know, you could argue that we're doing this uh, after the uh, horse has already left the barn, so to, so to speak. You know, we've really so tremendously altered the landscape of North America that, uh, you know, you have to have to say that we're, we're starting very, very late to figure out what might have happened a long time ago. Um, we could have some very lively discussions on the subject, very lively. And I think the answer to your question is nobody knows. And I would love to hear Andoni's uh, response to that as well. I, I would not disagree with anything you said. The only thing I will mention is that there are an, there are a couple of initiatives like this. So there is, uh, I think Jerry talked about the bumblebee surveys that have taken place. Uh, and there's a few of them that are ongoing. Montana has a program kind of like ours. And I know there's been periodic surveys here and there, but I know there's an initiative out of UC Riverside to try and uh, create something of a national framework. The question is, where do you survey? I mean, if you go into an agricultural area, you're not gonna find any of these, oops, any of these more interesting bees. Like to find them, they're in pockets. They're in little places. If you don't know where to look, if you don't know what the plant communities are, you're never gonna find them. And so it becomes a very, uh, the question is how do you do it? You can't just lay a grid across the state and just blindly sample. Bee communities are very patchy. So it's gonna be a tricky thing. And I think our perspective has been more long-term. We need to develop the people with the experience within the state. And then from that part, be able to work backwards to think about which, which are the, what plant communities currently in Oregon really are key points that we need to protect. Okay, um, here's another question. Uh, this, this, let's see who wants to take this one. Now that the murder hornets are here, how will this impact your projects? Anybody know what? You want to go for that one? Um, I was talking to some folks about the uh, new hornet uh, the other day. Are you up on that one, Andoni? Well, I would. Well, I'll, I'll get, let Jerry, maybe he's, he's got the same information I do. They're, they're not, we've not detected them in Oregon at this point, and they're, you know, there's a limited number of finds. It, they, may be, uh, they may be established, but we have not seen any in 2020 yet. Um, but I think from our perspective, I think having people on the ground who know the bee community is really important because we can detect things. So, for example, we have a lot of invasive bees. Honeybees are not the only introduced bee. There's many, many invasive bees that are right across, uh, right across Oregon. Our volunteers may be the only ones to even know that they're here. And I think having people on the ground who know what they're doing and know what they're, you know, investing in their capacities, you know, allows us to be able to get in front of some of these issues and detect them and be able to have quick responses, which are really, really key to sort of containing any invasive species. Okay. Uh, anything to add to that, Jerry? Or should we move to the next question? Well, I think, I think that's a very uh, good answer. Uh, many insect invaders have not been noticed until it's too late. And that's a real problem. In this case, this wasp is like this big. So, you know, he's going to be fairly noticeable. And uh, whether that helps you to find them or not, that's a problem. Uh, if you've been reading the newspaper accounts of these new wasps, um, a lot of those uh, articles interviewed um, um, uh, uh, Chris Looney. Chris Looney is the 
a state entomologist with the state of Washington who was interviewed in those articles. And uh, uh, I, I talked to him about this the other day. The, the problem is early in the season, before they have a colony going, it's just the queens that overwinter. And those are the ones that are going to be really hard to find because there's just going to be one of them. And, you know, how do you find a nest of one darn thing? It's going to be tough. So everybody needs to be looking out for this thing. And we need to jump on it, you know, now. Okay, we um, have another question here in the chat, which is, how might climate change going forward affect bee populations and diversity in the Pacific Northwest? Okay, I, I think I better grab that one. I mentioned in my talk the whole idea that the National Park Service nationwide was doing a bee inventory program. The specific reason for that program, all the national parks nationwide, was because of our concerns about climate change. We were concerned that bee species that are already located in high alpine meadows where the snow line is so really up there and where the summer is late in arriving, that those bees would be most at risk from climate change by being basically forced up off the top of the mountain. Mm -hmm. So we were targeting specifically high country alpine meadows in that inventory. So we gathered some very, very good baseline information nationwide, and Sam Drogi is the key person in that whole thing. So uh, and Donny, I don't know whatever else you would add to that, but there's a huge concern about that exact topic. Okay, uh, a couple more questions. One I of which I'm, I'm going to say for the last. Uh, did, uh, did you want to add something, Andoni? I agree. Okay. Um, next question is: uh, To what extent? Do accumulated water soluble pesticides slash herbicides affect bee populations along irrigation pathways? That one that one's yours. Um well I don't know. Uh I would I, I would think that in um there there is there has been uh recent information uh we generally haven't worried about um, uh, when it comes to honeybees uh, um, contamination of water sources. Uh, it, it, there is a there is an issue. Um, as Heike will probably tell you, um, she's really the honeybee expert on the call. But that um, honeybees will um, pick up water, especially when trying to cool down the hive. And if there is pesticides, and then they can bring them back, and that can be a source of exposure. But the other issue is that we do. I think as Jerry pointed out, there's a number of ground nesting bees. And there's been um, some recent studies of um, not in terms of uh, irrig um, contaminated uh, irrigation water um, uh, getting into the nest, but more in terms of seed that contains pesticide, insecticide uh, having effects on ground nesting bees. So I would say there's a lot of uncertainty a lot around the exposure. But I would say there is the, there's the other issue of herbicides, and I will say, by and large, I think Paraquat is the only herbicide with um, sort of credible bee toxicity claims. And by and large, herbicides are not the issue when it comes in terms of direct toxicity. The problem with herbicides is that they change the plant community, uh, which for better or for worse, you sometimes if you want to do a restoration project and you need to clean up that seed bank. I don't know if you saw those irrigation uh, irrigation pipelines, but they've been neglected for a long time. The um, some of the weeds there were fierce. And to get that under control, you're going to need to use some uh, herbicide regime to be able to uh, get that pollinator, get that plant community going. Um, fungicides are a bit more complicated, but I would say the biggest issue when it comes to pesticides is insecticides that are found in water. And of course, um, a number of them are water soluble. Um, the systemic ones that you know have got a lot of attention um, are specifically water soluble because they're made to move through the phloem of the plant. So it is an issue. Uh, and I know at this very moment, EPA is evaluating as a public comment period for some of the neonicotinoids, which are water soluble and widely used. Um, and um, 
a big concern there are aquatic invertebrates, even more so than pollinators, I would say. Which is uh, Jerry's thing. Yes. I feel like I need to add something to what Andoni just said, and it's more general than it's this, uh, than just dealing with hymenoptera, with bees. There has been a great deal of literature in the last couple of years on massive declines of invertebrates worldwide that have been documented, documented, and documented. This is just beginning. It all started, I believe, with a paper uh, from Germany, and I think it was in Ecological Applications, I don't remember the, the journal, but at any rate, they reported massive decreases in just the pure volume of flying insect biomass. And then other people around the world have been picking this up and trying to duplicate those studies and finding it very, very, very frequent and huge numbers of disappearing things that you know you wouldn't notice okay you're driving in your car um you used to maybe notice certain times of the year you would get a lot of insect splatters on your windshield and now maybe you're not noticing them that much mm -hmm. and you know you may not care about that you may think well you know less windshield to clean but the fact is that the numbers of invertebrates are drastically declining right now and bees are just one kind of those you know, take all of them. And it's the, in my opinion, and in the scientists, in the uh, author's opinion, it's the combined impacts of airborne and waterborne pesticides of all different kinds that are just out there with nobody really keeping much track of it that uh, is causing this. And we, we will pay that price sooner or later. We will pay that price. Can I add just one quick thing? It, it, it also, just I'm thinking about Central Oregon specifically. So um, there's been a uh, hike as part of the uh, Honey Bee Lab at uh, OSU, and they've worked really extensively with Central Oregon seeds. And the, the, one of the problems that we have in Oregon is that many of the crops are specialty crops. They don't have a lot of pesticides available to them. And it's a struggle sometimes for them to get um, more modern. Uh, uh, insecticides to deal with their pest problems. And so I think um, Central Oregon Seeds has been pretty receptive to this conversation with pollinators. They're, I think one of the, uh, when it comes to um, agricultural groups that have sort of invested in bee research, they've been really at the forefront. They're a pretty good partner. Uh, you probably have dealt with them on many issues and maybe in some things it's a little bit difficult, but they've been very good on pollinator issues. And specifically, I think, you know, uh, thinking about uh, making partnerships out on bee issues in Central Oregon, um, that might be a, a good opportunity. And in addition, I think uh, part of this um, um, initiative um, right now around uh, you know, you know, getting some pollinator habitat, Hike has been working really extensively. She's really been at the lead of this, getting pollinator habitat fragments around uh, carrot seed fields. and. I don't know. There's, it seems like the moment is right for something to happen in Central Oregon. There's a lot of things lining up, <laughs> including the work that you guys are doing and sort of at the middle of. I think it, there's some um, promise on the horizon. Okay, uh, we have one other question here. Uh, someone who's used the raised hand feature, and this is uh, David Dobkin. Would you like to express your question and please tell me who you're addressing it to? Um, it's, uh, I, I suppose, to Jerry, but also to Andani as, as well. Um, in looking at the map where sampling uh, has been done in Oregon, um, that was pretty impressive density of, of, of dots. I was pleased to see that. However, there was one very um, significant area in southeastern Oregon um, that is com completely devoid of, of sampling. Um, and that is the Hart Mountain National Antelope Refuge, which is a federal national wildlife refuge. And the reason I point that out, uh, having uh, done quite a bit of research there for the last uh, three decades, this is uh, the most intact native plant communities representing uh, shrub steppe landscapes and native riparian landscapes that we have um, that are great basin types in Oregon. Uh, and it would, uh, from my experience, both there and in central Nevada, which of course is the black hole of, uh, of insect sampling as well as sampling of every other taxon, 
Um, the bee diversity, native bee diversity, appears to be quite extensive, relatively speaking. Um, and so elevational transects, even just a handful of them across uh, both temporally and spatially, um, would be probably very illuminating. Uh, and <laughs> hey, David? Yeah? David? Yeah. What are you doing next week? Ah, gee, it's funny you ask. <laughs> <laughs> I aim uh, to get out there, truthfully. Good, well, that might be a good possibility. Uh, yeah. But I really think I really think that that is that uh, is going to otherwise be a very undersampled um, ecosystem uh, that you will if you just sample elsewhere in southeastern Oregon uh, uh, relative to this um, very ecologically restored landscape. Comments? <laughs> I, I'm going to pass this to Andoni, but you know I've just recently become involved in this group right here. And uh, I am game for anything that they were those folks where Anthony and your folks would assign me. I'll go out there. We deputized Jerry to go. <laughs> I'll Part I got of all the gear. I got all the gear you need. So I'll so I'll just say that one of the issues that we're starting out, and so getting permits to get onto uh, federal land is is a has been a challenge, and I'm I'm the the poor sod. Uh, charged with doing this for the volunteers. Um, but I do think uh, you're completely right. That when you look at surveys of Nevada and Oregon, they look, uh, I've seen um, the Bee Lab in Logan uh, create uh, heat maps of biodiversity, and I think they're misleading. I think there's been poor sampling in some places. And the other thing that you said that I think is very significant is this point that I brought up. You can't the bee diversity is going to be patchy. There are going to be little spots where you're going to find the more interesting bees. They have very close plant host associations. And if you miss those spots, you're going to miss stuff. Anyways, I, I think the other thing I've heard I, uh, um, uh, um, from people getting onto, getting into Heart Mountain and getting a permit, it's a little difficult, but uh, we are hopeful. <laughs> I, I'm, going to help certainly... with that. I'm going to work with that. I'm going to help you with that. Okay, I think we're gonna, uh, we are approaching the 6.30 witching hour, and I think it's time to move to Gail. Okay. Well, I have taken notes, but I will say that um, when there was a discussion about the decline in pollinators throughout the world, I went and grabbed the latest Nat Geo magazine, and I don't know if you, hmm, Let's see, maybe if I turn it upside down, you'll be able to read it. It actually, it says, um, uh, insects are disappearing at alarming rates that could be dis disastrous for the planet. You'll miss them when they're gone. Um, so I, that leads me to our, our work locally. And, and Sam has described this as, you know, we see a global problem and we are so excited that locally in our community in Central Oregon, we have a chance to work with amazing partners to help um, address the problem. Um, Anthony, you mentioned, mentioned Central Oregon Seed. They've been a great partner for us. About a year and a half ago, two years ago, I was meeting with Mike Weber from Central Oregon Seeds, and he was introducing me to some of his um, fellow um, farmers and people in the agricultural business community. And it was my first opportunity to tell them about the shared vision. I was nervous. I told them what we were doing. And after we got done with that part of the conversation, somebody turned to Mike and said, Mike, how are the bees? And it was, I just thought, bingo. Here's our connection um, with, you know, I'm coming from the environmental side. Um, and I could, I could just see that here's an opportunity for us to begin to see just how how closely our lives are connected we all like to eat we rely on farmers i'd say one of the aspects of the work that we've been doing as coalition is recognizing and acknowledging the farmers in central oregon as the stewards of the land and water and so when we talk about these problems um we we begin with that, that acknowledgement and recognition of what we're asking farmers to do to produce food and um, wanting to work with them, realizing that we're part of this community, we rely on them. So we want to work with them, in this case, to create the pollinator plots that can help both domestic bees and the native bees. 
we are, I'm going to look at my notes here. I was jotting things down. Um, so many amazing people working um, in this arena. Heike's name kept being mentioned. Um, of course, you heard from Jerry and from Andoni. Um, Heike and Tony uh, Stefan. Um, so what I'd like to do is uh, let you know that we will add resources as appropriate to our website, website web page for um, plotting for pollinators. So you can go to coalitionforthedistutes.org and then under the shared vision menu, uh, find um, plotting for pollinators page. Um, sign up for our newsletter if you'd like to know more about what we're doing. Sid has been recording this program. We will. Um, post that to YouTube as soon as we get that done. Actually, I'll send out an, a newsletter on Monday and I'll include the link to the YouTube and I'll include links for the various resources that have been discussed. Um, let's see, I have, I do have a question. Um, and Donnie, how do you pronounce your name? It's always the mystery. Um, yeah, just not Anthony. My mom and my wife call me two different things. So uh, the way you said it was fine. Okay, I'll, I, <laughs> I, I call my, I call myself, I introduce myself, I say, hey, my name is Adoni. Adoni, okay, what, yeah. what does your wife call you? Um, okay, see, that's I can't tell, I can't tell, I'd, I'd have to hear them both, I've been told this. <laughs> what does your mom call you? That's what I want to know. No, okay. <laughs> so I'm going to call you Andoni, so thank you, thank you, Andoni, thank you, Jerry, thank you both so very much, this has been wonderful. Um, thanks to everybody who tuned in and participated uh, participated in the program thanks to sid for bringing our zoom um man of the moment and um thanks to all of our wonderful partners who are working on this project with us and with that i will bid you a good evening <laughs>